Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that while you are spirit, while you are holy, you have determined to reveal your character and your will to us. And you have done so through your word, the Bible. We thank you for its profundity that we can never delve the depths of the spiritual truths that are there. And yet we praise you that those truths are simple and plain. Anyone can read it and understand by your Spirit. So as we come to it this morning, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just guide and direct in the knowledge of the holiness of God, which you would desire of us this morning. In Christ's precious name, Amen. Well, as we begin, I'm going to remind you that we're in a series called The Marks of a Healthy Church, which means, first and foremost, that we're not doing expository preaching. I would love to be able to take Romans and 10 that we're looking at and actually just spend an hour or two dissecting it a little bit. But these sermons are more topical. They allow us to jump into uh, issues that help us to discern what a healthy church is supposed to be. So, Again, I want to encourage you, there are one or two copies in the library of this new book. Uh, and uh, if you want to follow through or learn a little bit more, please just sign it out. I don't know if you've been watching or reading any of the major Christian blogs, but there's a, a growing discontent, at least in the North American church, amongst all of us who would call ourselves conservative and Protestant, that... There's something wrong with the word evangelical these days. It's a term that's been around for centuries, but it's just, it's got such a breadth to it and a lot of uh, a wrong or bad meaning to it. it. The word first came up around 300 years ago. It came apart as the first great awakening when we had men like Whitfield and Wesley. They were preaching to tens of thousands of people in the public. And God was doing a wonderful thing. He brought revival. And not just a small revival where it would be one church or a few people within the church. There are documented accounts where whole towns in a matter of a week or two became Christian. The bars were closed and people were out of jobs. But they praised the Lord and went to church. So there was a real movement of God and a conviction of sin and an understanding that we need to make ourselves committed to Christ. But since then, the word evangelical or evangelicalism has, again, grown to mean other things. It's much broader. Now, if you talk to most of us or, or any good Christian, they will probably tell you that it is a good word. It, it, it has a spiritual connotation to it that says, we believe people must be born again. You can't just simply say, I want to follow Christ, or I think he's a great guy, I'm going to go to church. We can't just align ourselves. We have to be connected vitally with him. And we talk about the born again experience. And, and there are four spiritual truths, and we talk about evangelicalism as a whole. One is that we believe that this is the authoritative Word of God. It has everything we need for life here and now. We also believe that Jesus' death on the cross is the only sacrifice that we need to remove the penalty of sin. It is the only thing that can make, make us right with God. We also believe that it is only those who trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior that they will know eternal life. So it's important that for us, this number fourth, or the fourth one, is that we must be committed to personal evangelism. This is an issue of spiritual life or spiritual death. This is an issue of heaven, of hell. And we are commended to go forth and to preach the gospel. But again, part of the problem in our culture today is that this word evangelical has become a catchword, a catchphrase. It can mean anyone who has been grown up in a, in a church or have gone to church as a, as a little uh, child. It can mean anyone who has had any kind of a religious experience at all. It, it could simply mean that you attend church on a regular basis right now. Well, I'm an evangelical church because I know the church I attend is evangelical even though you may not do much. 
In a poll in 2014 in America, 35% of Americans claim to be born-again evangelical Christians. But if you've been watching what's been going on in the States through the election and over the past year, you'll recognize that there's such a wide difference in people's understandings. There's people on both sides, both Republicans and Democrats, they call themselves born-again Christians. They have such divergent views, not only on faith, but morality. You have pro-abortionists on one side, and you can even have white supremacists on the other. And they all call themselves born-again Christians, evangelicals. So what's happened to create this world problem, or this, this wide problem that we have, at least in North America, that everything is all-inclusive? Well, part of the issue is that we have failed to understand what true conversion is all about. And that's our topic for today. So I don't know if, if you've been following these the posts or not, but about eight years ago, some key religious leaders and pastors in North America noticed a huge shift within the church itself. It's a generational thing. It is a huge cultural shift. And it's started by redefining some of the basic terms that we would take for granted in the church. They use the same religious language, but the problem is, as they speak, they will use different definitions, or put nuances on them. So they, they will talk about a commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They will talk about the authority of the Word of God, but their understanding, fundamentally, underneath, is different from what it has been for generations, for centuries. Words like heaven, hell, sin, judgment, the church, have all of these new meanings that change radically what the Word of God says. And in reworking these terms, one of the key doctrines that has been forever changed, at least right now in our culture, is this doctrine of conversion. So what is conversion? And why is it necessary? If you were to go to a dictionary right now, and you were to look up spiritual conversion, it would say something like this. You're changing commitments. You're adapting a new belief structure. You are uh, abandoning one faith and picking up another. So if I were to tell you this afternoon that I have converted to Hinduism, I've abandoned my former Christian self, I'm not a pastor anymore, you would understand that I have embraced a new way of life. And that way of life has religious beliefs and religious practices. I probably wouldn't eat many, much meat. I'd have a mark on my forehead to demonstrate the sign of my faith. I would practice pujas or religious ceremonies with incense. I'd go to rituals and festivals. All of this would be a way of life as well as uh, uh, an outworking of my belief. But this is not what biblical conversion is all about. And this is where many churches go seriously wrong. Biblical conversion isn't simply deciding to align myself with a particular group, with a particular faith, with a particular church. It's not simply changing my perspective or the way I think. It's not even saying that I'm going to follow Jesus right now. Why? Because this kind of conversion has no power to fundamentally change the sinful nature that we have. It has no power to deal with sin. If we're simply talking about my decision one day to become a Buddhist, become a Muslim, it has no power to change my inherent sinful person. And that's what the Bible teaches, doesn't it? We have a fundamental problem called sin. All peoples everywhere are sinners. There is no one righteous, no, not even one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are sinners first and foremost because when Adam and Eve sinned, when they rebelled, they plunged the whole human race into sin. Humanity was fatally wounded. 
every aspect of our nature is infected by sin. And we actively choose to sin continually. And because we're sinners, we're under the wrath of God. Every aspect of us, our wills, our emotion, our thoughts, our desires, are affected, are imprisoned by sin. And what's worse is that we're unable to do anything about it in and of ourselves. We cannot change our standing before God. We cannot save ourselves. Now add to this the problem of who the Bible says God is. And our situation goes from bad to worse. Because the Word of God tells us that He is perfectly holy and righteous in all ways. And this creates the issue that there is no way that He will allow sinful people into His presence. He is also our Creator God. He made us to bear His image. And so in that, He has called us to be holy as He is holy. But we're unable to do that because of this sinful nature. So you put the two together, we've got our problem with sin and the nature of God's holiness, and it means that we are a people in desperate need of God to reconcile, not simply to say, I'm going to go to that church, or I'm going to be a follower now. There's no way that we can restore our rightful place of worship and service for God unless our sins are paid for. And we can't do that. But praise the Lord, this is why God the Father sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life and then die in our place as our ransom. He paid the penalty for our sin. He satisfied the Father's holy demands for perfect obedience. He satisfied the demands of perfect righteousness that we are incapable or incapable of doing. So conversion is necessary for two reasons. One, we're sinners. Number two, God our Creator is holy. But again, what exactly is conversion? And this is where we're probably going to have to sharpen our pencils a little bit this morning and sharpen our understandings of, of what we may have thought before. Most of the time when we're Christians and we're talking about conversion, we speak of it in terms of being born again. But I want to challenge you that there is a difference between being born again and conversion. We're really talking about two different aspects of our salvation. Two different, but both necessary for salvation. Now while they both may happen almost at the same time, here's a sentence you may need to write down. One naturally precedes and is the necessary requirement for the second. So we have conversion, we have the born again experience, but one naturally precedes and is the necessary requirement for the other. When we talk about being born again, we're talking really about the theological term of regeneration. The all-important God's sovereign first step in transforming our lives and making us spiritually alive again. And that's what 1 Peter chapter 1 is talking about. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us. We have been passive bystanders of God's sovereign renewal in our lives, making us new spiritual creatures. And you think about John chapter 3 and Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he wants to know what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. Jesus says, you must be born again. Well, 
Nicodemus doesn't quite understand. The reality is there is no physical way that a man or a woman can save themselves. And Nicodemus was wrestling with that issue. Being born again is the work of the Holy Spirit to transform us, to regenerate us, to make us responsive to the spiritual call of God. That's the promise of Ezekiel 36. That wonderful chapter in the Old Testament that was given to the people of God that said, I'm going to make a new covenant with my people. I am going to give you a new heart. Why? Because Israel needed a new heart. They were incapable of being obedient. They were incapable of loving and serving Yahweh as he deserved to be served and as he called them to serve. But this is a foundational promise, chapter 36 of Ezekiel, of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. We are given new hearts in this process of regeneration. It's also, in large part, the truth that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says that we are now new creatures in Christ. God has created something new out of the ashes. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are now quantitatively, qualitatively, something different from what we once were because God has wrought a miracle in us. So that is regeneration. When we talk about conversion, we're really talking about the necessary response of faith to the transforming work of God that has already gone on in our life. So it's our spirit, our soul, our, 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 our life waking up to the spiritual truth and crying out to God and receiving by faith Jesus Christ as our Savior. It is an automated response to newness of life. Just as a baby is born and cries out that first gasp for breath, when we are born again, that first gasp of breath is conversion and calling out and receiving Christ as our Savior. So biblically, conversion isn't being born again. Being born again, that new birth is the necessary requirement for conversion because unless God first does something in us to make us spiritually alive, we are incapable of responding to the gospel. Think of it in terms of planting. I'm sure everyone here has had a garden at one point or another. You have to go out and you have to dig the ground. You have to till it. You have to prepare it. That's the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Then the seed of faith is implanted in it. And as the seed germinates, it brings forth the fruit of conversion. So one necessarily pre-exists the other. They, they may happen all at the same time, but biblically God has to make the first step. We have to be made spiritually alive to Him. So if conversion is our necessary response to being born again of the Spirit of God, what exactly are we talking about? What is conversion? Well, biblically, again, conversion involves the whole person. It involves our mind. It involves our body. It involves our spirit. It involves our soul. It's not saying, simply giving lip service that I'm going to be a Christian. It is a complete change in our nature. It is saying, I am turning away from sin, that is, repenting of sin, and I am turning by faith in Christ. I am appropriating the grace and the mercy of Christ that has been given to me. So if you look at Romans 10, 9-12, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul says there is a verbal confession that is necessary for all of those who would claim themselves to be Christian. We have to say, Jesus is our Lord in every aspect of our life. It means that we must renounce all other allegiances in this world. 
whether they literally be of the world or if they are found within ourselves, our families, whatever it may be, it means that I am claiming the Lordship of Christ in my life in all areas. I am renouncing my former way of living. In recognizing Christ's Lordship, you're saying that you no longer are your own person, your own man or your own woman, that Jesus died for you and that His death paid the penalty for your sin. You now belong to Him. Paul also says that there must be a turning to Christ which is trusting Him wholeheartedly without reservation in His death and His resurrection. You must place your hands, or you place your life into the hands of Christ, believing that His resurrection from the grave means that we have newness of life here and now and the promise of eternal life when we die or Christ comes. We are no longer slaves to sin. So conversion is a 180 degree turn. It is renouncing my former life, it is renouncing sin, and it is turning to Jesus Christ and appropriating, receiving by faith everything that He has done. It's turning from sin and rejecting its dominion over us. It's turning to Christ and receiving, accepting His Lordship in our life. Now, I remember when I was saved, I shared different parts of this at different times, but at the age of 24, you know I was sliding very quickly into the punk subculture of Kitchener-Waterloo, and a wonderful German couple in Kitchener shared the gospel with me around their kitchen table. I knew that I was a sinner in desperate need of salvation, and I cried like a baby. And there was a newness of life that was with that. The cursing, the drugs, a lot of things that, that would have hindered me from serving and loving Jesus were taken from me that night as a miracle. And I remember very explicitly sitting down with a friend, uh, an associate pastor from Kitchener, and I went through my record collection. You remember anyone who's over 40 used to have record collections in those milk containers, right? I had six or seven of those, and I had hundreds of records. I picked them all out one by one and gave them away. It was necessary for my repentance and my rejection of my former life. I also remember someone at the church saying, well, you got a wonderful testimony. Why don't you go down to those bars where everything's so seedy in Kitchener and, and start sharing the gospel with people? You've got a unique way to go in. They, they recognize you. You can play a game of pool with them. You can have a Coke, and they don't know there's nothing in there. And you can share the gospel. And I said, I have been saved from that life. Someone else may be able to go in and do that. I have and rescind that so easily entangles me. I now serve Christ. And praise the Lord, I never look back. But that's exactly what we must do. We must reject our sin and our former lifestyle, repent of that, and we must cling to Jesus Christ as the only means of our salvation. So faith and repentance are both necessary. There are two sides of the same coin. We must repent of sin. And we must put our faith in Jesus Christ. So as we look at Romans 10, I hope you notice that it is in the form of a wonderful promise. We can take great encouragement. First and foremost, it says, All who confess and believe, all who repent and place their faith in Christ, will be saved. There is no one who is so hardened in their heart that God cannot make alive, that cannot make their voice to cry out to Jesus, Save me, Lord! 
It is a wonderful promise for any of us who have family who do not know Jesus Christ. Maybe they've attended church, as mine have, for years, and yet they have not claimed themselves to be Christian because they know what it means. They have heard it from me. They must be born again, and they must conf confess total loyalty to Christ. They must reject sin. They're wonderful people, but they're not saved. It's a wonderful promise that salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit, the sovereign work of God, and that the forgiveness of sins is there for all. And this paradigm, this promise, does not change from one generation to the other, one century to the other, just because our culture is different, just because our society is different. It is the same repentance, it is the same faith as 300 years ago, as 2,000 years ago. It is God working in the same means to bring about the same results, faith and trust in Him. The gospel is that simple. Repent and believe. That's it. So why <clears throat> is this all so important this morning? Because we live in North America and in our Christianese culture we have muddied the water so much that these terms now don't have the same biblical weight that they used to. And we wonder why the church is unable to make any real spiritual impact into the world. We, we don't hear sermons uh, calling people to repentance, teaching what is the holiness of God, calling them to complete allegiance in Christ. We focus on redefining these issues so that they're not abrasive. They are seeker-sensitive. And we woo people with the concept of community. But the concept of community without Christ is not community. This other side, again, we've created this problem because we have taken a term. It may not necessarily be a biblical term. It comes from a biblical word, but in the format we use, it's, it's not in the Word of God. And it had a wonderful meaning, and it still does to many of us. You must be born again, and we believe the Word of God is authoritative in all things. But again, we have defined words like sin and hell, wrath and salvation. And we fail to preach what the Bible really teaches about these things. So part of the problem is that we are not empowering you to understand what you have truly been saved from. Because once you know what you've saved from, we are compelled to go out and to share that good news. And you are empowered with a word that is not of your own. It is of God that He will save. And what a wonderful promise that is again. But we've created a church and there's many consequences. How do you baptize people? How do you bring them into membership? Too many churches do not have the doctrine of conversion at its very heart. So you get a church that is supposed to be a church, a body of holy people. Not perfect, but holy in Christ, seeking after righteousness. But we have men and women who are anything but holy. Leaders who are anything but holy. We end up with a church that professes to know Jesus Christ, but they're really unable to know the very will of God because they have no understanding of the power of God in their life. So we fail on many sides. All because we have not called people to conversion, to repent, and to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Part of the problem is over the centuries, we have gotten into a process of conversion without redemption. We would say, we call it um, decisional regeneration, that you simply have to raise your hand to be born again. You simply have to come to the front. You simply have to sin say the sinner's prayer. And those are good and necessary things. There must be a confession. But if that is the only thing, if there has been no change in the very nature of who you are, if God has not first wrought in you and made you a spiritual creature, you're not saved. 
And people can and do confess, but are not born again. So not only do we need to keep the doctrine of conversion centered, we need to keep that doctrine of redemption, that doctrine of, of the born again experience. They go hand in hand. What's worse, and we have a whole generation thinking they're saved. All because we fail to define our terms biblically. All because we fail to be exacting in our teaching about what biblical conversion is. Now I don't believe in zombies and I know there's a lot of zombie apocalypse things out there but the reality is, is many of these Christians are Christian zombies. They think they're Christians and they walk around but there's no life in them. They're, they're not saved. We become a church whose task is neutered. We are unable to witness to the glory of God. There is no power to transform our lives individually, as families, or as a church. Again, all because we have not called people to repent and believe. It's not a perfect example. But in thinking of that light and how it does not shine when we are not truly converted... Any of you have had a car for a while and you know your, the, the headlights start getting covered over in that film, right? You look at it and you can't even see the light bulb anymore. And you know it works at night because you see a, a little bit of light go out before you. But what do you have to do? You have to buy a restoration kit to clean the light. God needs to restore the people to Him. He needs to restore the church to these doctrines which are so key to being who we're called to be. Another problem is that we end up inoculating people, a whole generation to the gospel. If you don't know, an inoculation, most of the time, a live vaccine means that they give you a little bit of the virus and you, you grow an immunity to it. Well, we do the same thing when we call people to come to church and we share with them and we tell them that Jesus is this wonderful guy or we even say that he's a savior, but we never call them to faith and repentance. So they hear the story over and over and over again and when life gets difficult, they are unable because they have already rejected out of the false or the poor testimony that we have already given them. Some people just want fire insurance. Some people just want to add something else to their collection so that they're trusting in this and Jesus. Others will claim to be Christians or followers of Christ and yet end up walking away from the church and rejecting everything when life gets difficult. Why? Because they were never truly converted in the first place. We need to call people to repent of their sin. To surrender their lives to the sovereign authority of Jesus Christ. And we must seek professions of faith that demonstrate not only am I professing, but I believe I have been born again by the Spirit of God. The two must come hand in hand. So if there's a possibility that someone can make a profession of faith, can say a sinner's prayer or walk up to the front, and they're not truly born again, how can you be assured of your salvation? That's a deep theological question that we have to wrestle with, isn't it? Some would say, well, we need to look at the fruit of the Spirit. And that if the fruit of the Spirit is evident in your life, obviously the Holy Spirit, we can take comfort in that. But here is the philosophical question with taking that route. How do we quantify the growth of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? How do you quantify those things? Even harder, how can you differentiate the kind or the quality of joy, peace, and self-control that is of Christ and that is demonstrated in the world. You can have a wonderful Muslim who is a very gentle and faithful woman. 
How do you quantify or qualify the difference in their gentleness and perseverance as opposed to yours in Christ? You can't. How do I know that my gentleness is not simply a result that God had made me this way? I, I don't like to argue too much. I kind of shy away. How do I know it's not simply going through the school of hard knocks? I've just learned to take it on the chin. and. Not. How do I know that this gentleness is of the same kind and quality as Christ's? I can't. Ultimately, our only assurance comes as a result of God's sovereign work of regeneration in our life. Let me say that again. Ultimately, our assurance of salvation comes only as a result of God's sovereign work of regeneration. Because we have repented and called unto Christ as our Lord and Savior, our conversion stands as a signpost. It helps us to remember that day when we made a commitment. But even then, in and of itself, it may be hollow if there is not the deeper reality that God has first worked in us to make us a new creature in Christ. The only real assurance we have of our salvation is this. That we wrestle with sin and we grow in our godliness. The only assurance we have is based on our conversion. I once re renounced that way of life. I renounced sin. I clung to Christ as my Lord and Savior. And in this difficult time, I choose to walk forward in that same faith. It's a growing in humbleness before the Lord. And recognition that I, I'm a sinner. And as I get older, I recognize how much more sin still governs me. And so I come to the Lord seeking His help. It, it, it's a recognition that as I come to difficult times, I'm seeking others to help me make those right decisions. And those decisions are not the ones that I would naturally make. They are against my first will, my, my first desire, because they are the ones that fulfill the glory of Christ and not me first. So th there must be this wrestling that I'm, st I'm a sinner I, I'm in daily need of communion with God to move forward in that godliness. So having once definitively left that world behind and clung to Christ, I now struggle to maintain that walk forward until He calls me again. That is our ultimate and only assurance of salvation. And that's a struggle. Because we have a whole generation who does not want to just struggle with sin. Who doesn't understand that their wrestling with holiness is the only assurance they have of their salvation. So the question I need to ask you is, where are you in your struggle? And it, it may not simply be, well, I didn't want to get up this morning and come to church. I didn't feel well. Those are real things. I'm talking, when was the last time you were so overwhelmed by your sin that you cried unto God and said, help me? When was the last time that you made a conscious decision to do what was right and good in the eyes of God according to the Word of God as opposed to the easy thing? When was the last time that you knew that you were obedient to the Word of God and not your flesh? This should be our daily wrestling, brothers, sisters. This should be our daily calling of encouragement one to another that you are not alone. That we are all in this same predicament. We all need each other for encouragement. So what does this mean for our life? 
how should a biblical understanding of conversion impact us personally? Well, I want to just quickly outline five things. It should make us humble. Why? If we're not growing in humbleness, we're not recognizing who we are before a holy God. We're not recognizing the inborn sin that is still there, that, that still draws us, our hearts and our minds, away from the things of God. But it's a great encouragement to know that as we struggle with that and we grow humbly, God is with us. It makes us joyful to see how great and unlikely our salvation is that even though we were sinners, even though we were separated by God, under the wrath of God, under the condemnation and deserving of hell, He loved us and saved us. Likewise, every moment of every day, it is only the blood of Jesus Christ that He sees and not my sin. But what a wonderful thing that is to know that He sees that. It should give joy to our life that we have been covered by the blood of Christ. It should be fuel for our evangelism, number two. Again, knowing that ultimately salvation is the work of God, that we simply need to call people to repentance and faith in Christ. So as you go forth this afternoon to the grocery store, to the laundromat, wherever it is, you are simply called to be faithful to the knowledge and the understanding of the gospel that has been given to you. It is not up to you to argue someone into the kingdom of God. Simply show them what the Word of God says and calls. Back away and allow them to deal with that spiritual truth. Again, it should be, number four, fuel for our godly living. Because I know that even as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, I am a sinner before God. But here's the promise. Because I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ and renounced this world and desire to walk in that godliness, God will guide and direct in all of the difficulties of life. Whether it's wrestling with my sin, whether it's dealing with the issues of this world, the potential of nuclear war, it doesn't matter. God can give us joy here and now because it is Him working in and through us. So it can be fuel for godly living. Number five, it gives us patience because we know it all depends on God's timetable. We can patiently pursue someone day after day, year after year, a husband, a wife, a child, and place them in God's care, knowing that in His perfect timing, He will do what He desires to do. And what wonderful promise that is. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 11, please, for a second. It's a very simple verse, Acts 11, verse 26. <clears throat> Let's start with 25 in the middle. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found them, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. I don't know if you realize that as well as the discussion with chucking out that whole word evangelical, there are some people now starting to say, we need to distance ourselves from the word Christian. Because Christian doesn't mean much to people anymore. You can have, again, white supremacists, and you can have pro-abortionists, and everything in between, and they all claim to be Christian, and yet there is no conviction, there is no uh, decision for Christ. So we have a church without the power of God to live. Now, I'm not one to give up on those things yet. <laughs> but there's something powerful for me as I look at this verse. This, this, they're first called Christians in Antioch. You, you probably know that this was not the name that was given to them, or that they took upon themselves, sorry. It was given to them by the world around them. 
by those who would look upon them and spurn them and, and put them down. Oh, they're Christians, they're followers of Christ. It also comes about, because if you didn't know, Antioch was the hub of a world trade system. It was rich, it was diverse, it was a walled city, and within that walled city there were communities that lived hived off from one another, like a wheel has spokes in it. The Jewish people would live here, the Cyrenians would live here, and, and all around they would have their own designation. But Christians would come together in one place from all of these places. They would renounce their former lives, their former culture, their former identity, and come to one place together, saved by the power of the resurrection. I think that's a powerful image for us to walk forward with. That God does and will save people. God calls us to bring people to repentance, to call them to place their faith in Christ. We are called out of this world to be a community of, of believers. Those who have been born again and have been converted by the profession of our faith. We renounce the world around us. And I think that's going to be so important in the days to come because you know things are only going to get worse. Things are coming to a head, even in North America, well, we will know persecution. We will know judgment. What are we going to stand on? Are we going to call ourselves Christians? Because God has saved us and we profess allegiance and loyalty to Him? Or are we going to leave it behind? Our Heavenly Father, we understand that this is a wonderful high calling, and yet it's so intimidating. It's so easy for us to get things wrong. We ask, Lord God, that you would guide us. And there is someone who does not know you as Christ, that you would work in their heart. For the rest of us, Lord God, who struggle every day with our sin, help us to find victory in Christ. Help us to come back to the cross and continually cling to call our allegiance to him alone. We thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.